Hello, human people. I'm Neil Patrice Crumpets, and welcome to the Ed's World Documentary, where we have thrills, yes. spills, Basically waterboarded him. and shifty eyes. What's that you say? You don't know what Ed's World is? Well, I'll give you a quick update by downloading over 10 years of Ed's World history directly into your brain. Here we go! <laughs> well then, now that you're all caught up, let's get on with the informational programming. Say a friendly human greeting to the lovely meatbags responsible for the legacy of Ed Gould and his show, Ed's World. My name is Matt Hargreaves, and I play Matt in Ed's World, as well as doing it for you other things behind the scenes. My name is Thomas Tomsko Ridgewell, and I am the co-writer and co-producer and co-person in it of Ed's World. I'm good at talking as well. Professional. Hi there, I'm Eddie Bowley, and I am the co-writer and co-producer of Ed's World, uh, alongside Tom. And I also do the voice of uh, John, the neighbour. Like what she said, we were stupid. Ha! He did the thing! I did the thing! I've known Ed for a long time through the like the Newgrounds community, the comics community. I used to do uh, a webcomic and Ed was a fan of it and we kind of traded messages and stuff and I saw, hey, you, you do these great cartoons, you know, let's be friends. And so then, yeah, we'll we meet up at all these conventions and just hang out and have a really good time and we do like cameo voices for each other, like he did something for me, I did something for him and then, um, yeah, just been a, a firm fan of the show for a long, long time. Uh, actually, I'm underwater, as are you. Hmm, clearly one of us is lying. So I'm going to wait until the truth comes out. Fine with me. I got involved with Ed's World somewhere along the lines of like 11 or so years ago when I first met Ed on a website called Stick Suicide and he was making just these really terrible kind of stickman animations but you know to me at the age of like 12 or so I was like this is the best thing ever and I just kind of spammed him until eventually we were friends. Then when kind of Ed's World started off the way it is now, which was, you know, with, with me, Ed, Matt, and Todd, I was there, I was in his cartoon because he basically just drew his friends. So when I became one of his friends, he drew me, even though I wasn't voicing my own character at that time. I just had to judge who's naughty and who's nice. Eventually I got a microphone and my voice broke. Yeah. And I started being in it. Pardon me, neighbor. What a lovely day. Could we perchance borrow a cup of your finest sugar? Oh God, you gotta help us. Our house is haunted. It'll glow. What's this giant monument? Does anyone have any more trousers? Ed's World began for me when I met Ed. He was already actually making a comic called Ed's World with his friends in it. Um, it was him, David, and a couple of other guys. And then we found a couple of animation tools on the school computers. Very simple GIF stuff uh, with stick figures. Logically, he went from drawing his friends as the much better drawn characters on the uh, comic to stick figures and then obviously when it got a bit better and we found Flash eventually I was kind of drawn into it in terms of well literally being drawn into the Ed's world world Matt? He was always he always he was always doodling and I think it just doodling. was like he always wanted to He's just in his own world and animate. He? That's yeah, it, so. pretty much. Just one of the main reasons I think it advanced and went further was he got terribly bullied when he was at um, junior school. Mm. And he began to, that people used to watch his little doodlings and drawings and as he did the animations he got more recognised. I think yeah. he would have done it anyway. But he, he was, being, he he was having anything. kids throwing things at him from the back of the class and things like that before that. And it was his, uh, his way of escaping yeah, into yeah, his yeah. own little world. Definitely. And that's yeah, and that's when he you know, he met Matt, obviously, and they they, they were both being... Uh, and yet the characters were always just happened to be his friends from school. <laughs> <laughs> In college, he boomed. I think the second that people got more oh, mature yeah, around different. him. College, he's now like a... Le I mean, a friend of mine did the same course he did the next year after. And Ever was literally the example that he used. He was the person they were like... This is how you do it, more or less. And he was on the wall, his, his work was being displayed. And, and, all, and all the time also, keep keeping on from that, when he, when he was in hospital, it yeah. was the fans and this that mm. kept him going. Definitely. Most definitely. I think he was, yeah. I think in, in some strange way, I think he was literally happy to be able to just sit by a computer and have no one question him. Because all day, he could sit at the computer. No one's ever going to go like, why don't you, you know, go outside and play in the park? No, 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 no. no. Yeah. He, can, he can sit and do exactly what he wants to do. Literally all day, every day. He just, he liked, exactly what he did. He liked making jokes. Like, it was, yeah. That was his whole thing. Like just laughing all the time. I think, you know. That's true. My journey of becoming kind of involved in Ed's World was very, very gradual. It was like just one little step at a time. Like, I think the first instance of me being in Ed's World was something I'd drawn myself, a, a caricature of me, that Ed actually just added that drawing into the cartoon and then eventually evolved into him drawing me. And then it became a, a voiced character that wasn't even voiced by me, but then it was voiced by me. And then very soon I started writing my own lines because he'd give me lines and I'd be like, I'm not saying that, I'm saying my own thing. Mm, what a perplex what a perplexing crime. Hey, you there, stop. Chasing, 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 chasing. He's gonna catch the bad guy, he's gonna catch the bad guy. Detective Cool is so awesome, yeah. I really can't say how long ago it was. Maybe it was, you know, 10 years ago, maybe it was 11 years ago, but Ed had me sa sign a contract for my involvement in Ed's Bowl where basically it was like this thing he'd drawn in paint. 
It was like, you belong to Ed Zord, and if you ever leave, I will kill you. And I signed that unknowingly. And now I'm stuck for life now. That was legally binding. It's really hard to say exactly when, I guess, I kind of became a, a partner. And I don't know if it's quite presumptuous to say that, because I'm sure if Ed were here, he'd be like, you're not my partner, you are my subservient. I think I, I, I started becoming a much bigger role in Ed's world around about when I was 18, 19, when I, I kind of formally started writing fully with Ed, like just actually coming up with the whole episodes and becoming very involved in the creation of the episodes. You know, I started doing the soundscapes myself. I started providing a lot of the music. I think Spares is the first episode where it's like very much me because that episode was almost entirely written by me. I did almost all the music and I did all the sound design and stuff. So I think that's the kind of the first time where it was like started becoming very involved, very, very involved in the cartoon. <laughs> Oh, bugger. I remember sitting around and Ed didn't have any idea what he wanted to do for the next animation. I wrote down a list of things that, they, that he'd already done, followed by a list of kind of stereotypical things we could do. Like, well, like well, we could do cowboys, or we could do like, go to space. Or hey, what about Atlantis? And then for specifically for the Atlantis one, he went, no, that's a stupid idea. We're not doing that. Two weeks later, he started animating 25 Feet Under the Sea, where we all go to Atlantis. And he can't remember it. He said, no, I don't remember you saying that. 25 Feet Under the Sea was pretty much written while we were in Devon on holiday. Me and Ed, we were walking down the street and we'd already got to the point where we were talking about going underwater and all that stuff and the Atlantis thing. Trying to go back and forth and he's like, what about something like 20,000 leagues under the sea? And he's like, yeah, well, how do they get there? What about they go in the toilet? And he's like, okay, great, they go in the toilet. He goes, I know, how about 25 feet under the seat? He goes, why? Because it rhymes, 40,000 leagues under the sea, leagues, sea, 25 feet. And I was like, okay, that works. And I think my biggest claim to fame is naming that episode. I thought that uh, What the Future was a big turning point. I love that one. That's the one I watched uh, like yeah, there because I liked it rather than because Ed made it. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I watched it more than once. I think that's the first time I started telling friends about it. And uh, really? I think so. The first time I like I would like uh, pull a friend over and say, watch this. One that made me laugh the most was seeing Victoria playing a female Ed. I've always wondered what a female Ed would look like. I thought that was very funny. Yeah, well, we all, <laughs> all the kids I teach, that's the funny thing. All the kids I teach will make tiny references. I've had one of my students say, I like trains, and I'm, yeah. I was ecstatic. But I like, I, I don't know, I played it cool. I didn't want to like, it felt a bit like opening. I didn't want to like, because shouting my brother's Ed. It was two things at the same time, because I know they'd be excited, but at the same time they would be immediately so this kind of like yeah, sense of complete like sadness and yeah. I didn't like, it was kind of nice keeping it to myself. I think one of my favorite things that never happened in, in, with Ed's world is when we had to, we were, we were making What the Future, there needed to be a scene where Ed got blasted with a keg of cola. <laughs> to do that, basically we just put towels on Ed. This is how we do it at Ed's world studios. And then just put, basically waterboarded it. <laughs> we just poured water on Ed's face while he had to scream the line. <laughs> Ed wasn't a very good voice actor, so you'd have to come and go to very extreme lengths to get him to perform. So I couldn't be like, Ed, just gargle some water in your mouth and then say the line. No, we had to properly drown him to get that line out there, which is good. I had fun, he didn't, but I did. And that's what matters. Wow! Waterboarding, newfound friends, and it seems Ed's world was getting bigger and better. As Ed kept on creating, the world began spinning faster and faster, snowballing in popularity. He gained a fandom, worked with numerous companies, and even made the news. From his bedroom in Lincoln, Ed Gaunt is helping to shape the views of the next generation on the controversial issue of climate change. However, in 2011, a cancer that Ed had already fought into remission once made an unexpected return. With acute lymphoblastic leukemia, a cancer of the white blood cells, Ed and his world momentarily stopped spinning. A few days later, Ed released a video featuring himself, Thomas Ridgewell, and Matt Hargreaves discussing the diagnosis. I'm gonna be uh, away from a computer for a while, so work on comics and animations. It's probably gonna be pretty stacked because of the gravity of this illness. The Ed heads rallied online with a battle cry that shook the world into spinning once again. Despite his illness, Ed carried on creating. He started work on a new episode, Space Face. He's doing something stupid again, isn't he? Yep. We know what it is yet? Nope. But I'm sure we're gonna find out. But sadly, despite all odds, on the morning of March 25th, 2012, Ed Gould sadly passed away after a six-year-long battle with cancer. Ed heads from all around the world banded together and shared their love for their late friend and inspiration. Yeah. Cheers to Ed. 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 Ed. To Ed Gould. To Ed. For Ed.
Ed's final wish was for his world to keep on spinning. And in June 2012, Ed's World Legacy was created under the banner Save the Show, Save the World. And save the world they did. Raising over $83,000, the show came back to life and Ed's World kept on spinning. But that's enough of me. Let's find out how the team got involved with the legacy, the difficulties of taking over the show, and replacing the heart and voice of the show, Ed. How I got into Ed's World Legacy was Ed dying, essentially, halfway through one of the animations. Space Face, part one. Even though that is already split into two animations, he died halfway through animating it. We really wanted to see it finish. Tom decided to do a Kickstarter. Hey Ed Heads, right, so first of all I want to let all the awesome people who have donated to Ed's World Legacy know where their perks are and what's happening and stuff, but I quickly want to apologise for us all not getting on with Ed's World as quick as we should have. It's taking us a while to come to terms with losing Ed, and it's making it difficult to be funny. Knock knock. Who's there? I'm sad. We got pumped up and we got like, yes, yes, let's do that, that's great. And then we got all the money and I was like, oh, I guess we've got to do this then. Even though I consider myself a pessimist, I never really planned for you know the eventuality that Ed might die you know because everyone else in his life you know took his cancer so seriously and everyone you know everyone would always be so sad around him I didn't want to be like that I wanted to you know be very encouraging and very you know kind of treat his cancer like like an inconvenience kind of in the way that he did so whenever I went to visit him I'd be like oh my god what happened and and like get out of bed you're so lazy yeah buddy you're gonna kick its ass dance it this is naturally uh, Ed having looking at me the first time this is actually it returning so uh... So if this is the fill, it will be called Return of the Leukemia. <laughs> but you know, because of that, we never really properly discussed what would happen if Ed had died. And we had we had kind of joked about getting him into my apartment and just recording like hundreds of random lines of dialogue. Like, oh no, a banana! You know, just getting through loads of lines of dialogue so that if he did die, we could kind of keep the show going with his voice and just write episodes around what he said. That's a shark! I've longed for this day! Back to the property market! The day before he died, Paul and I actually did ha had had a conversation, kind of a joking conversation about like, oh, like well, if Ed dies, we'll have to get like like a voice changer or something in the show, and it was just really dark. But kind of then all of that really did happen. Well, this isn't my voice. <laughs> the Outdoor Legacy fundraiser was my idea, and it was probably one of my worst ideas to date because I really didn't know what I was getting myself into. We wanted to keep the show going, and Ed wanted us to keep the show going, and Ed's mum really wanted us to keep the show going, and the fans wanted us to keep the show going, but I thought that if I funded the show out of the profits the show was making, you know, through through like merchandise and stuff, people would accuse me of essentially profiting off Ed's death. So I said like, I will, I promised that I would give all the money the show made directly to charity, but that we would need, you know, fan money to um, kind of help us, us run the show. And people were still mean anyway and still accused me of, of, of kind of embezzling anyway. So in hindsight, I probably, shouldn't have done the fundraiser the way I did. Once that money was given to us, suddenly it went from being this thing that we wanted to do for our friend to this absolute obligation, and that made it very kind of scary, and I think that put a lot of people off being involved in it. I, I probably should have just used the money the show was making to fund the show, and then just kind of just accepted that people were going to be mean anyway, and just live with that. But I really did bring it on myself by starting this fundraiser. I burped. I was nervous about taking over as well and in terms of doing Legacy, if I'm entirely honest, initially I didn't want to do it at all. I, I hated the idea. But after a while, I became far more motivated. It probably took me two years to actually get to the point where I'm so happy that we're doing it. That's saying a lot, seeing as we're almost up to three years. I'm glad we've done it. I'm glad we kept it going. And it's really amazing seeing the response we've had from all the fans and even people that had never seen the show before. I wasn't so much nervous of taking over Red's World. I was actually more just incredibly overconfident. When I lost Ed, all I wanted to do was business and just just find something positive that could happen. Cause it's like, oh, this is terrible. There is nothing good about this. Maybe we can make something good. Give people hope, you know, keep the show going. I don't know what I'm doing, ah. And so, uh, you know, we, we started this fundraiser and it was all big plans and big hope. And, and anyway, I worked with Paul and it was like, Paul, do you reckon you can make like an episode every every few months and, and, and how much do you reckon we'll need? And then we realized, oh, we're stupid. We have no idea what we're doing. I hate this part. I guess the only real reason I felt like I was qualified to take over, you know, as a showrunner was because it had, for the first time ever, signed off on an episode I had 100% written. I, I had written Space Face, part one and part two, all by myself. And he was like, yep, this is great. And he had no notes on it. And I can't, and maybe, maybe that was just because he was so sick and wasn't thinking straight, but you know, I had finally written an episode that he needed. So basically he had kind of signed off on this idea that I could write like him. If I hadn't written Space Face before we'd lost Ed, I probably wouldn't have had that confidence 
you know, that knowledge that I can, I, I know how he would have thought. Matt, remember that time I told you I didn't hate you? Yeah! I lied! Oh. My first involvement in the legacy was Fun Dead. Tom approached me um, saying that he was struggling with the script. I said, sure, send me what you got. What I saw was that he only had most of the first scene and that was kind of it. And a list of jokes, but nothing really to sort of thread them together. I went ahead and had a go at the script myself, connecting all those jokes together, creating some new ones. And um, it essentially created almost the final version of Fun Dead. Please keep arms and legs inside the ride at all times. <laughs> I think Tom just saw that I was just very keen to do as much as I could for the show. And he saw that I could probably handle a lot of responsibilities. So he asked if I'd also step up to being co-producer of the show. So that involved liaising with the animators, keeping up a good rapport with everyone, and just sort of keeping everything together so that we can get these projects finally out. Yeah, I was nervous just because it's, it's a huge task. It's not just taking on a long cartoon project like any other. It's... It's something with a lot of emotional connection for a lot of people around the world. So there's a lot of very judgmental eyes watching. And if you make any kind of slip up, they'll be the ones to spot it. I was dedicated to making sure that we do a good show, not just repeating the same jokes from the old episodes. <laughs> no, I wanted to do something new and original and, and take things in like slightly new directions, but keeping it firmly grounded in the Ed's World universe. So, you know, things such as giving Eduardo a bit of a backstory. That's not really been done in an S-World episode before, and for what I've seen, a lot of people really, really like Edu Eduardo as a character. Any last words? I'm sorry. Yeah! But One of the interesting aspects we was able to bring to Ed's world was Toy Moore was sort of the character. To be fair, you know, sort of in the history of the show, They've been fairly sort of generic. You could almost trade dialogue with one character to another and it probably wouldn't make any difference at all. So what was a, sort of a challenge for us was to sort of sort of define the characters a little bit more. Ed was just kind of the all round guy, but he might occasionally be kind of sarcastic and he's also kind of the leader. Tom was the sort of more dim witted one with the crazy catchphrases. Matt was more of the sort of surly, sarcastic person and Todd was just kind of also there. He would occasionally have a line. Phew. But nothing really to make him that big a character. Over the course of the show, the characters had changed somewhat. When Todd left the show, Tom became more of the sort of sarcastic, surly character. Good riddance. Matt was the vain, dim-witted one. Nonsense. What about my DVD? What? But it still left Ed being sort of the generic all-round guy. Where did you even get this dog? I don't know! So one thing that I was quite conscious of, especially writing something like Fun Dead, was that, yes, he's the kind of more natural leader, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's always right. I feel that that makes him sort of a lot more of endearing of a character. The fact that he tries a lot, but doesn't always succeed. And also, introducing aspects to the show such as like soft arcs there's like a, a running subtle story that's been happening through many of the episodes now that may only get realized towards the end maybe recasting ed was a really difficult decision because i wasn't really sure if i wanted to you know go in a new direction with the character or if i wanted to try and get someone who basically just sounded like ed i originally approached a youtuber called cayenne who has a very like low very kind of monotone speaking voice and I thought like he would do a really good job of mimicking Ed's style. My name is Kyan and these are my thoughts. And he, he just he didn't want the responsibility and I totally understand why because no matter what we do with Ed's all it's never good enough like you know the, the, the voice actors are never good enough now or, or, or the writing isn't like Ed used to do it or the animation isn't like Ed used to do it. Duh. Among those the people who I auditioned there was Jack Howard, Dean Dobbs, uh, Jamie Spicer Lewis, uh, Eddie Bowley, Tim H. It was quite a lot of people that I had screaming in my bedroom for that line. It's good. It's a good time. It got, it got down to either Eddie or Tim. I ended up going with Tim because I thought it was an interesting direction to kind of like have the character be a little bit squeakier and a little bit more emotive. And Eddie wasn't happy about that at all. But he did get brought on as like co-writer, producer and director. So I feel like he wins in the long run. Sort of amongst, amongst our friends, we used to do this sort of 
monthly poker night and I think it must have been one of those and I happened to be at Tom's place. You know, he'd already been through a bunch of his friends, he'd auditioned virtually everyone and sort of, I think I think Jack sort of offhand mentioned, oh, you might as well, might as well audition Tim. Very, very like, hadn't planned for the audition and we sort of went into um, the other room. It was basically the scene in which the spaceship is crashing and so the audition consisted a lot of screaming. So I had to go into the other room and prove I could scream. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was it was very new to me at the time. I, I hadn't done a lot of voice acting, so you know Tom was kind of there guiding me through, explaining to you know do the motions. I was pretending to hold onto the steering wheel and keep going back to a lot of screaming, a lot of screaming. I think one of the main reasons I chose Tim as a voice actor is because unlike Eddie, he isn't really an aspiring voice actor. That kind of rough around the edges element to his voice acting kind of matched Ed's. It's really it sounds really mean to say, but like sometimes when it's a bit shit, it's like it used to be. I don't know, it's hard to explain. I felt like I got involved in Ed's world because I could tell it meant a lot to all my friends, really, and it felt like sort of one of those things you sort of can't say no to. It felt like an honor to be invited and to help kind of continue that legacy. It didn't feel like sort of like a, yes, I got a new part in a new in a new show. Like for all that it was exciting, it felt more like, I don't want to say an obligation, I don't want to say a duty, but it felt like something that I kind of needed to do to kind of, because because it kind of, it meant a lot to the fans clearly, and, and, and I sort of, in hindsight, definitely went back and watched all the shows and kind of saw that this show had been around for a long time and meant a lot to a lot of people, so it felt like something that kind of... you kind of needed to do for you. What a grueling process, hmm? Can't be easy dealing with grief whilst also working on a huge project like this. But what would I know? I never got programmed with emotions. Who needs them, right? Ha 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 ha! Just like the Avengers, Samuel L. Jackson, I mean Thomas Ridgewell, called upon Earth's greatest heroes, or the best he could find at such short notice to bring together a team to make their legacy dream a reality. The voice actors, the production team, the sound team, the Hulk, the animators, and the leaders of the team, Captain Edsworld, Eddie, and Tom. So, let's find out their own perspective on their individual roles and the true warriors of the legacy, the animators. There is no such thing as a standard Edsworld workday because basically we're all people who do other things that coming together to do Edsworld. So we kind of just come together when when needed, you know. Eddie took off Eddie took a couple of weeks off work to come and write all the Ed's World episodes with me. And then the animators just working when the animators are working. So there's there's big points. There's there's you know, there's points of about one to three months where the only thing that's happening is an animator is working. So pre-production involves obviously heavily the script. Tom and I will sit down and once we have sort of the core idea, we'll start drawing like a map of ideas. So we have some like key plot points or some key jokes that we know we want to go in and then we create like a map, like a thread, l lining up all those jokes and, and ideas together. So it becomes one sort of hopefully coherent script. After that, it moves on to uh, the voice recording, um, getting everyone to do all their lines. Please keep arms and legs so inside the ride at all times. That's the one. And then Matt and I will sit down together and we'll edit all the audio of the dialogue together. It's then passed over to Elliot to do uh, the rough sound design. The animator starts work on that. He'll be also, um, or she, uh, will be working on an animatic of it so that we can give immediate feedback before it gets too heavily into animation, just in case there's some very big changes we want to make. It's good to sort of nip those in the bud as soon as we can. And then yeah, once it's all signed off and all happy with, we proceed to final. So post-production, it's just kind of putting all these bits together. So it's it's putting together the sound design, which would already have music mixed in with it, as long as as well as the voice acting, laying it over the, with the animation, making any other small editing tweaks or changes if it's utterly necessary. And then yeah, then and get this boy out. The intention with Edward was originally gonna be that I would be the producer, director, and writer. So I would, you know, come up with the ideas, direct the animators, and I would be the producer as well, which would mean that I would be kind of overseeing everyone and, and, and make sure everyone was towing the line. It became very apparent quite early on that I just, I couldn't do that. I just wasn't strong enough to do that. So that's why Eddie came on to kind of be my partner on all of those things. It is definitely a team effort. Uh, I'd say that none of my jobs are just me and the show is probably better off for that. We've had the great fortune to work with a lot of extremely talented animators since starting up the legacy. Paul Tavord, he is an animation god wizard maniac. Every frame you can see just the, the utter dedication and artistic skill that goes into it. The man is not human. He is incredible at what he does and when you see some of the some of the shots he's done you you're just in awe at how amazing it looks. Iceberg down ahead. We are in the plane. Oh yeah. 
Cloudburn! He was also lucky to have Tobias Nip work with us on a short episode, and I was very grateful to him because he didn't just go into the episode with like blinkers on and doing exactly what he was told. He was willing to challenge us. We agreed on some points and we disagreed at some points, but we, we, we need that. We need to be challenged because sometimes there are things we're missing. Like there's a bit in Hide and Seek, the episode he made, um, where Matt's saying, oh, where shall I hide? Where shall I hide? And he said this very sort of calmly, but um, Tobias suggested, why not make him sort of more wild and panicky? And he had this idea of him sort of running around in a circle on the spot. And we thought that was a great idea. So we re-recorded Matt's line just for that reason. And the animation style of that episode is, is very toony, very akin to sort of the sort of the older style of Ed's World, and I think a lot of people really enjoyed that. That's quite a mouthful. Sandra Rivers, animator of Mirror Mirror, she has a fantastic animation style. It's very sort of very like Ren and Stimpy, uh, like Jonathan K or John K. It's very bouncy, lively, and from. As of the day of this recording, we haven't seen this yet, but I'm really excited to see it because I just know it's going to kick ass. Okay, that's it. No, not the face. We've also got Anthony Creed Price. He's also got a very great wide-eyed, very bouncy style. Like you can see the weight of characters sometimes. Like if a character turns his head, it's not just like the hair is static. It will kind of bob with him. And yeah, it's sort of the subtleties like that just kind of really brings a lot of life to uh, the episodes that he's making. No one hits my neighbor but me. <laughs> We also had Pearl work on an episode of Tom's Tales with us. She has a really great sort of cutesy style. Uh, it was purposely done to look like a black and white animatic, but she still gave that a sort of a, a lot of, I don't wanna keep saying life again. So give me something, give me another word other than life. Death. <laughs> she brought a lot of death to the project. She brought a lot of great fine detail to that project. So although it's a very simplistic looking episode, she, gave it everything to make it a really cool episode. Okay, throw the ball. Oh no, what have I done? Hey man, what's going on? Oh my God, did you kill that baseball? Uh, no. Yeah, you did, I saw you do it. Uh, 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 it was like that when I did it. I'm gonna tell everyone, I'm gonna tell the whole world. No, please don't do that. You're gonna go to jail. You're gonna go to jail where you belong. Oh no, what do I do? <sighs> We're very fortunate to get to work with such an incredible team of animators. So thank you guys. <laughs> Well, that definitely opened up my non-existent pre-programmed eyes to the talented humans behind this extraordinary project. The legacy has reached its end. Trickle Threat and Christmas Adventure by Brandon Turner, Salunatics by Pearl Zhang and her team, The End Part 1 by Paul Tavord, and for the very last episode of the Ed's World Legacy, the crew managed to rally together a huge team of animators to help out on the big finale. Okay, I'll, I'll my question is, screen, if you had to make one last video, just the last video before you died or anyway, your you just question... couldn't make another one what would it be what would it be like um hmm. uh i guess it would be like i'd probably like call in so many favors like get all the people i possibly i knew who animated to animate a bit of it just to make it like a great big finale kind of thing so it'd go out of a bang really so just like call in every favor i could possibly have just for that one final movie <laughs> Thing, it's truly not just one single meat bag with too many fleshy parts. Kill me! But having many more fleshy flailing limbs may have helped the team out, as this legacy project wasn't all sunshine and lollipops. A hiatus, unforeseen difficulties, and living up to not just their own expectations, but the expectations of the world they set out to save. A battle between the show, nostalgia, and its newfound legacy. So the hiatus between many of the episodes, especially the time it took to get in um, Space Phase Part 2 to get in Fun Dead out. Although we had a couple of short episodes in between, that was quite a, a grueling process. Tom was going through a lot of hard times. It was difficult for him to sort of deal with a lot of things at once, but also the huge burden that the show can be. There's a lot of pressure. There's a lot of harsh judgment. There's a lot of people with expectations of you. That can be incredibly hard to deal with. He was trying to take on a lot on his own. Also relying on people who 
ultimately failed. So it wasn't until he got sort of sort of more trustworthy people on board, such as myself, that we was able to finally get production back up and running. The plan with Edsworth Legacy was to, you know, just go at it, go really hard, go, go hard and fast, and just like knock out episodes like that and, and be wrapped up by the end of 2013 with all the episodes. And here we are in 2015. It kind of went on this massive hiatus because I just snapped. I took on, you know, all these, you know, roles of responsibility for myself and hadn't really involved anyone else in the responsibility roles. So when I just kind of fell apart and didn't want to do anything anymore, nothing happened anymore. Yeah, when I'm being uncooperative, everything grinds to a massive halt, basically. And that's why Eddie is such a necessary part because, you know, he's working when I'm not. I think that Tom gets a lot of unnecessary flack. A lot of the sort of more recent episodes, people are very keen to look for the seams, to look for the lines, to look for where the change happened. A lot of that is pinned solely on Tom. But the thing is, as, as I think this documentary will establish, it's not just Tom. There's a studio-sized team here, an international studio team, in fact. It's several people working together, dedicated to this cause. I think the big break in the series was, I guess, inevitable in a way, because I can't, I, I honestly can't imagine going through what Tom and Eddie and Matt had to go through, you know, losing the show's creator and also a p close personal friend who then also literally said, you know, could you please continue the show? So obviously you'd say yes, I can't imagine a world in which you wouldn't say yes to your friend, especially if they're, if that was sort of a big thing they wanted. But at the same time, grieving takes time and, it, and it's maybe not going to hit you immediately. And it feels like that's what happened. It feels like they sort of said yes, did the campaign, that energy was sort of still there, but then getting over a friend who's passed away is gonna take time. And I can't imagine having to not only try and do your utmost to produce great creative work, but it's technically someone else's baby. It's someone else's creation and you have to do that person justice and they're not even around to say whether or not it's what they would have wanted. And you're kind of having to guess that the whole time. And I can't stress enough how much I respect those guys for pulling through and eventually getting through that hiatus and getting the show back on the road. You see, there's this thing that I call PUD, which is post-upload depression. What that means is that when you make a project and when you pour your heart and soul into something and then you upload it, immediately you just feel like it's not enough and you're just crushed and you, you start projecting and, and you get one negative comment. You know, you're, you're thinking to yourself like, oh, this is terrible, I could have done so much better. And then just one person comments, this wasn't very good. And you go, oh, they're right, they all know. This is something that I noticed in Ed from the beginning. You know, Ed was always like this from 2003 when he, when he uploaded like the first kind of Ed's World animations. One bad comment would just tear you down and, it, and you'd pour all of your insecurities into this one negative comment, which would just validate everything. And so when we started putting out Ed's World episodes, whether it got one negative comment or a hundred, it would just, just tear us down. You know, we'd lose all confidence in it. And that's why I think a lot of animators only worked with us once or twice, no matter what they did. The comments about the animation largely were, this isn't good enough, this isn't like Ed's style, it's changed, I don't like it. And, and, and for any creative, that's horrible. We just can't live up to people's ideals, to, to, to the way people loved something when they were younger. What we do, we try to keep it as very Ed's world as possible. But at the same time, I don't wanna just make an Ed's world episode. I want it to be good. I want it to be something that I can look back on with pride. Something that we feel really honors the show by ensuring that we do the absolute best we can towards it. I think one of the immediate gratifying aspects of Ed's World is the response from the fans. The fans are hugely dedicated and very heavily emotionally attached. Some having grown up with the show, some been heavily inspired by the show with their own productions and stuff. So Ed's World means a lot to them. And so when we go to like MCM and panels and conventions and that kind of thing, you get fans coming up to you, thanking you for doing what you do and admiring your work and that kind of thing. It's it's a huge honor. The show means a lot to me as well. So it's a deep honor to be able to be such a huge part of it. To me, it, it always just meant, I don't know, it's like, like I, I had this kind of feeling with Ed World, which was kind of like step up and try and be there for someone else. This isn't about you. You can work on stuff and you can try and convey points and usually there's the kind of benefit of like, oh, and then you get the glory. You get the, you're so good, you're so talented, you, you've done this so well. Whereas with Ed's World, I don't really feel that. I feel it feels all about doing some something bigger than myself justice. And in a way, it's just humbling. It's it's something that puts things in perspective and it means that you know, in a, in a world where we're all trying to build brands and gain followings and stuff. It's actually quite nice to have a project that 
in that sense of the word, is kind of for the love of it, I guess. A lot of the people I know now and work closely with and to the point where some of my long-term dreams and aspirations are slowly being realized. The fact that I've been, for the past few years, so very incredibly creatively fulfilled to the point where some of my long-term ambitions and dreams are finally, closely, at least being realized. I owe that all to Ed. He was the reason I met anyone. He was always very humble, very down to earth, very talkative. He would be happy to chat to anyone. And so he made, he always made me feel welcome. And from that, just made friends and from that made more friends to the point now that I can call myself a co-writer, be kind of close to calling that my full-time job. I'd always be eternally grateful to Ed because he's the reason that all that, that all happened. Honestly, I can say that there's a lot of reasons why we did Ed's World Legacy. I think, you know, if I'm being honest, one of the main reasons that I kind of rushed into it was because I felt like I'd failed Ed as a friend. You know, I felt like I hadn't seen him enough when he was in hospital and I hadn't helped enough in my mind. I was like, well, if I if I run this show and if I make loads of episodes, maybe I can make it up to him. Didn't do that very well, in all honesty. Yeah, I guess I, guess I really just thought that I could fix things. They say that the five stages of grief, you know, it starts with denial. And maybe that's what Ed's World Legacy was to me, was just this really long, this really prolonged period of denial of me just thinking like, no, he's not gone. See, he's... I guess Ed's World Legacy also just is about kind of honoring Ed's legacy and, and the things he achieved by kind of giving him one last Hurrah, you know, taking the show to a point where it feels like it's kind of a satisfying point to move on from. You know, obviously there are plenty of people out there who, who don't want the show to ever end and stuff, but I, I, I can't do it forever. It sounds very selfish, but losing Ed was probably the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And working on Ed's World is just kind of constantly reminding me of that. Ed's World is a show that's made for the fans, by the fans. It's not something we could have done without their full support to which we are really grateful and honored that we we get to do this that we get to continue the show for the legacy for ed so thank you i guess i just want to thank you guys for making the show possible and i'd like to think that we've made a bit of a difference in the world not just to you guys and to the fans but also to the charities we've donated to and hopefully the show has just caused more good out there. To the legacy donators, we're sorry. We've taken a while. Thanks for being patient. Just how much um, it all meant to him and how much it mm. would mean to him that he carried on because that's what he said to me when he, when he had one of his darkest hours that he wanted to, he, his world to keep on going with him in it because that would be like he was still alive. Um, and you know, this has, I mean, it's helped me a great deal that it has kept on going, yes, but he would have been so, so proud of everybody. I guess to the donators of Ed's World Legacy, I have two things to say, and that is, thank you so much. I didn't expect, you know, the response that we got, I didn't expect so much generosity. When, when we first put out the fundraiser, I really thought, I turned to Paul and I said, this is never going to work, but it did, and, and, and you know, we broke, and, and we beat the goal in, in, in the space of a few days, and, and then we exceeded it, and that was amazing. But the other thing I really want to say is I'm sorry. I made a promise that I couldn't keep and I, I messed around with a lot of people's money. I don't think I lived up to a lot of people's expectations as well with the show. So yeah, those are the two things I really want to say is thank you and I'm sorry. But I hope you enjoyed the show. Yes. <laughs> One final thought. The Legacy achieved its goals and despite its troubled production, the team still managed to raise over 80,176 human pounds. All the money gained from the Ed's World channel since the start of the legacy has gone to Click Sergeant, a UK-based charity which provides support to children and young people with cancer. So Click Sergeant is the UK's leading cancer charity for children and young people. We actually provide a lot of the support for children and young people diagnosed with cancer. There's no research to the, um, to the work that we do. So we provide support from the point of diagnosis and even after um, cancer treatment is finished. And in some cases, we actually provide support um, for bereaved cases as well. So on behalf of the team here at Click Sergeant, I'd like to say a massive thanks um, to the supporters at Ed's World. Your donations so far have made a huge impact on the, on the lives of children and young people diagnosed with cancer. Thank you, Ed's World. It's pretty swell.
So thank you, and goodbye, fleshy human people. Program terminated!